For businesses that are in the B2B trade, the number one need is access to working capital. The introduction of a bank to the intermediation of working capital requires risk underwriting. The problem with this is minority-owned businesses utilize our platform 5.8 times more than their majority cohorts. It's wrong that a minority business faces failure more than a majority business. That has to do with systemic bias in humankind. So if you eliminate risk underwriting, you can eliminate risk bias. Hi everyone, it's Julie Verhage Greenberg here with your Tux Time podcast from FinTech Today, where we talk about all things FinTech. And in this episode, I am joined by Sandy Kemper, the chairman and CEO of a company called C2FO, which you may not have heard of, but it helps with something that's really important to businesses, which is cash flow. So Sandy, I'm super excited to dive into this with you. Uh, all the way from, from Kansas City, we're gonna have to have a barbecue competition at there, some there, point There's no way that Austin can compete. When you were in New York, <laughs> would have worked better. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think we can compete. We'll, we'll see. We'll. We'll. Uh, we'll have to play it out. How are there you? There we go. I'm good. 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 I am good. So let's start off with a, a brief description of what you guys do, because, I, like I said, businesses are familiar with you, but a, a general consumer listening to this podcast probably doesn't know what C2FO is. Well, as a recovering banker and probably one of the older people you've had on this fine show of <laughs> yours, what we try to do is is make working capital more convenient and lower cost for small, mid-size and, and other businesses of scale as well. In the old days as a banker, I would loan against accounts receivable in order to get people their working capital. Well, if you took that account receivable that that supplier had to, let's say, Costco or Amazon or Intel or uh, Walmart, you would take risk in loaning against that AR. But if you were able to take the AR and match it to the AP, and allow for that large enterprise to pay that supplier faster, you could eliminate credit risk, reduce the cost of that capital, and increase the convenience or flow of that capital. And we started this business a little more than 10 years ago, and we're now, I think, the largest provider of working capital in the world that's not a bank. Crazy, crazy. Um, so you don't do this just by like going out to small businesses yourself. You have a lot of partners that you work with to get distribution and whatnot as well. Talk to me a little bit about those partnerships and how that process has evolved over the years. So the, the number one partner is always that large center node. So if you think about that enterprise and their ecosystem of suppliers and customers, it's the flow of payment between the enterprise and suppliers and the flow of receipt between that enterprise's customer and themselves. So that's, that's our go-to-market primarily, though you're right, we do have partnerships with a number of firms, one of which we just announced not too long ago was Marcus through Goldman Sachs. And here we're thinking about ways to get even additional or more capital to suppliers beyond just that which we can match in our marketplace. We match 1.5 trillion of AP and AR every year. We create, well, we're almost to 100 billion in flows across those those principles, those trading partners, but there's a lot more capital, a lot more need for lending than we can satisfy it just through matched AP and AR. And that's where Marcus comes in. Very interesting. Because yeah, when I think of Marcus, I think of a very, very like consumer product. I don't think of small businesses when I think of them. That's right. I think I think they're looking at expanding market, but I think they're thinking about expanding market through use of data. So one of the things that's maybe attractive for us is that we see 40 million approved invoices coming into our system every night from the largest companies in the world. And those 40 million approved invoices are then pushed out to the 1.2 million customers we have across the world saying, here's what your customer is going to pay you and when. And then in our platform, they're able to say, well, wait a minute, I'd like to be paid sooner. And if you pay me sooner, you can pay me 50 basis points less or 47 basis points less. Well, we've got all this data coming in or all these data coming in and that helps us make more informed decisions than I could have made when I was a banker when I didn't have that data. So I think Marcus values and some of our other partners value that amount of data that we have. Yeah, and you, you mentioned being a banker before. Is that what gave you the idea for this? Or what sort of like made you want to start a company focused on, on this product? Well, it, it, I was a banker back in my more successful days, I suppose. <laughs> what, 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 caused me, what caused me to think about this was one of the companies I started after being a banker wasn't doing very well. But I had, I had done a good job getting a good team, and, and we were able to get a lot of good customers, but it was in the nuclear winter of 2001, 2002. And I remember my CFO coming in and saying, uh, we're going to miss payroll. 
And I said, oh, well, I can't borrow because no bank's going to loan to us. We're a startup. <laughs> I don't have any more money to put into the company. And the VCs aren't going to provide anything. This is a terrible time for fintech at that time. It was e-commerce play at that time. Uh, so I called up one of my customers. And I said, can you pay us early? And they said, okay. And, and I realized that there was no, it took a lot of courage to do that. I mean, I could have been put on a credit mm-hmm. watch list. But there was no marketplace. There was no, no vehicle where you could automate this process. So we began back in 2000, 2006, 2007, 2008, probably 2008, to begin putting our thoughts around this, writing the tech, creating the patents that allowed for people to name their rate for the working capital they wanted as an inducement to get their customers to pay them sooner. And then to do it at scale across, now today, as I said, a little bit more than 1.2 million customers, that the origin of that was just the pain and suffering I had as a small business trying to get through a really tough time because I didn't have access to working capital because I was too risky to borrow. Yeah. So what what areas like what types of businesses are so popular on your platform? I mean, obviously, if it's focusing a lot on accounts payable, accounts receivable, I think of companies that have a lot of that going on that would would find this very useful. Well, it, it, business trade in the course of a year is around 220 to 240 trillion. If you're thinking about 60 days average payment terms, that means there's $40 trillion of accounts receivable on the books of businesses on any given day around the world. As an old banker, I will tell you that the numbers that I've run in the U.S. and in the Western states and extrapolated to the Eastern is that there's maybe 4 or $5 trillion of formal finance available for that $40 trillion need. Hmm. So it's not just about doing things against banks. In many ways, that's a small part of the market. And banks do a lot of great things in this world. Our job is to go after those vac- that vacuum that exists away from traditional finance. So any business that has working capital needs, big, small, in between, any business that has B2B trade can use our platform to make that B2B trade more attractive for them and payments happen more rapidly for them. And they can do it at a rate they name. And so the patents that we, we wrote allow for us, at least for the time being, to be the only company in the world that allows companies, individual companies, to be able to name their rate for the working capital they need. So saying, look, pay me early and having the buyer push a rate to me, I can say, look, I've got $500,000 and I'm borrowing 400000 from the bank and I want to replace my bank debt with you and my bank's at 6%, so I want to do this at 5%. And oh, by the way, I take a little bit more at 4%. You get to layer your order book according to the price that works for you relative to your working capital, which nobody's ever done before. And it makes it super easy for businesses of all size to use us. You make this all sound so easy and so simple. Yeah, I feel like there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. Like, I don't know, in any, in any founder's journey, there's always this time where it's like, oh, I don't think this is going to work or, oh, this is going to be too hard. I can't do this. Like, walk me through that a little bit because you've been, you've been through all of this. <laughs> I think for a founder, that's always the way. It's, it's the way you feel founding this business of yours, right? We yeah. all, all, are we good enough? Do we have it built enough? There's so much more for us to do. I said, I said we match $1.5 trillion of AP and AR. And, and, you know, we're just now approaching 100 billion of, of funded flows in a year that there's a lot more for us to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, walk me through like the, the thought process. Obviously, you do have a lot more to do, but how do you manage that? Like why partner with Marcus by Goldman Sachs yeah. now versus focusing your time on something else? The number one impediment for business growth around the world is access to capital. For businesses that are in the B2B trade who have businesses as customers, the number one need is access to working capital. The system's not there today. I told you about the vacuum that exists between that $40 trillion opportunity and the four or five trillion of formal finance. The reason you do this is because if you do it right, you can increase the world's GDP. You can increase the number of people that are employed. You can increase success for families that are that are growing and, and building their businesses and the system is a great system across the world. Financial systems are wonderful. They're, they're economic engines for the, for the nation's economy. They're just not as effective when it comes to working capital. The introduction of a bank to the intermediation of working capital requires risk underwriting. Mm. Right? And part of the problem with this is you think about those folks that are underserved. Minority-owned businesses utilize our platform 5.8 times more than their majority cohorts. Female, WB, female-run businesses, 
2.6x more. Small business is 2.6x more. So if you eliminate risk underwriting, you can eliminate risk bias. So I, I don't mean this as a, as a gross overstatement, but, but generally we in the banking world, when I was a banker, I had to think about failure rates. In a majority environment, minority firms fail more than majority firms. That has to be part of your thinking. Therefore, you have to be more careful sometimes relative to the extension of credit. Well, it's wrong that a minority business faces failure more than majority business. That has to do with systemic bias in humankind. Let's, let's eliminate, therefore, the need for risk underwriting, and you can eliminate the excuse for risk bias. Totally, totally. So, I mean, one time that I can think of in recent memory where there are a lot of small businesses that needed a lot of help is just in the pandemic, especially restaurants and others as well. Did you guys, what kind of role did you guys play with that? Because I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this quite yet. We had extraordinary demand. Uh, we wanted very much to, to not only create convenient capital, but low cost capital. So we, we went mm -hmm. to our, our large buyer nodes, we went to our funders who help us secure additional funding, whether it was, it was Marcus back then, but other financial players, pushing rate down. So our average rate last year in the United States for the funding we provided was 5.2% APR. What's that usually? Uh, normally six high sixes would okay. be about right, mid sixes for the US, a little bit higher worldwide. But 85% of small businesses, at least the surveys we've done across thousands and thousands, are spending more than 8% for their working capital. And some folks can't get access to working capital. So in many cases, as is appropriate in a high-risk environment, the financial system, the number one responsibility for banks, beyond being good stewards and, and doing the right thing, is to protect their depositors' money. And in a downturn or crisis, you're... You, you, you draw in. You're, you're more mm -hmm. thoughtful than you have to be. And, and I think here, again, if you eliminate risk underwriting, you eliminate the need to draw in because there is no risk when Costco pays their supplier early. There is no risk when Pfizer pays their... There's just no risk when you facilitate an early payment, whereas in the financial world, when you make a loan, there's always risk. So just all these changes and things that we've gone through over the past 18 months or so. How do you think that changes both your business and just the way people think about the lending environment moving forward from a business perspective? I think the, the more risk we see in a system, the more sort of the, the, the vicissitudes of, of, of a system, success, failure, success, failure, the more cycling we have and the more volatility we have, the more we realize what an impediment risk underwriting is providing capital to those who need it. So shocks like this to the system, while being very difficult for the system, help companies like ours who are bringing a different solution to a problem that shouldn't exist. There shouldn't be a risk underwriting need for working capital if you can match the world's AP and the world's AR. Right. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. And now something else the pandemic did was it made a lot of people move to other cities. I, for instance, moved to Austin. Um, people moved to the suburbs and bought homes. And people realized they don't want to be at an office five days a week for eight plus hours a day, right? And you guys are one where you do have some people that work right there in Kansas City with you, but you have a lot of people that are in areas across yeah. the world. Uh, what sort of advice do you have for both founders, as well as people working for companies that are remote? Because I think there's so many questions swirling around this right now. It's like everything else. And the, the more remote and distant and siloed, the more you need to focus on communication. And it's, it's difficult because we feel sometimes like it's a forced march with all of these Zooms. Uh, we've done a couple of things that, that I think have been fun. We, we, we're doing more off-sites. Uh, we're, we're bringing people in when travel allows. We're bringing people together in more fun environments, trying to not force social interaction, but, but have some fun with social interac interaction, allowing, allowing people to see each other. We are, we're, we're, human beings are social animals, and, mm -hmm. and having an opportunity to connect physically is still very important for most. You may not need to do it at the office, but it doesn't mean you can't and shouldn't create environments to do it elsewhere. So we're doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on more connections socially for our folks all around the world. And the thing I miss the most right now about travel isn't my ability to go sit down with a big center node. It's my ability to go sit down with our team in Noida, 
or sit down with our, our, our team in, in Delhi or sit down with our team in Seattle and have a dinner and, and tell them over a glass of wine how grateful I am for what they've done and, and share common stories that are motivational and meaningful to our company. So for those employees that you don't get to see as often anymore, what sort of advice do you have for both them and other people in their same situation where there's some people that are going into the office and do get to see you and then there's others that, you know, they want to make sure, oh, like, even though I'm not in the office, I want to make sure that, like, I'm up for that promotion and I get career advancement. I would, when, when possible, I would argue for senior leadership to go to the team rather than having the team come to you. Uh, I think that shows humility and grace and, and acceptance. Now, it's not always possible. I can't, I can't pop into someone's house and say, let's have dinner. Um, <laughs> but, but finding excuses to come together, as I said, in, in not a prescribed way, but in, in physical locations and spending time, again, just common stories. We have, we have a saying inside the company, it's not it's not so much. Like humans, humans have forever told history and stories around the campfires, and often they're singing these stories. I don't particularly care what the accent is. I don't care what the language is. What I care about is, are there campfires and are there people around them singing? And are they singing, albeit with different accents and different tones and different words, are they still singing, celebrating the things that matter to us? So finding ways to continue to tell those communal stories Preferably in small groups with intimate environments around that campfire, paying attention to the Dunbar number, that's, that's fundamental to doing exactly what you want to see done, and that's maintaining that connection even when we're physically remote. Yeah. So how, you know, staying remote moving forward, How you mentioned how massive this space is. How do you make sure that you are executing that on that and, you know, fulfilling your, your mission of really helping businesses get access to yeah. not only capital, but affordable capital? Still, as I said, still stories, right? So how do you, how do you make sure that the voice of the customer is heard? Even as a small company, we're motivated by the success we enable for our customers, right? And, and as I said, small company, only eight, 900 people around the world in 160 different com- countries where we serve customers. I think we are, we're physically proximate in, I don't know, 16 different nations. That, 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 that from day one, that caused us to be disparate. So we were, we were always putting the customer's voice first as the unifier. If there was not as much nobility of cause and, and for us, it's you know, did we did we help that business succeed? Were they able? Was was that entrepreneur? Was she able to hire that individual to go get that new account? And did she tell us about it in a video post? And did we celebrate it inside our company? And, and was it was it in India? Was it in China? Was it in England? Was it in Germany? So in, and all of our people aren't there. So we've always been very good at encapsulating those stories, those narratives, from the voice of the customer and pushing them out to our team so that they could understand what they're doing and how it impacts the existence of our customer, not just the, the slightly better performance of our customer, the existence of our customer. And yeah. that unifies. And, and because of that, I think we've been very fortunate to have very, very little turnover in our company. So what does the future of C2FO look like? It's a good question. It looks like, it looks like what the team thinks it's going to do, right? As we, as it's not, it's not, it's not up to me to say what the future is going to be. It's, it's more, I'm at the age now and stage where I get a lot more fun out of watching the team <laughs> and, and build the company and do what they want. And I'm there to kind of remove barriers for them. I, I think it's just, it's more the same. How do you make more community happen with 1.2 million customers across all of these different nations? I think 64 different currencies in which we operate, 20 different languages. How do you, how do you create a true a geopolitical community united around the needs of small and mid-sized biz? And can you do it in a way that is, that is meaningful for your team and meaningful for your customers? So our number one metric is NPS inside the company. Our number two metric is NPS of our customers. Number three is funding. And, and you know, revenue's, revenue's there, but you know, revenue comes from our funding apparatus. But having, having that funding grow as it is today at about 70% per year, and we're growing from... 50, 50 billion to, gosh, 85 billion. You know, if we can continue growing at those rates, and it's such a big market, as long as we do it always with the heart and the mind and the need of our customer in front of us, we'll probably be okay. It's a big enough market that 
that I think lots of other people can be in it. Uh, so far, we've been lucky to be one of the few that's been successful in this space. But the world needs a lot more success because there are so many small and mid-sized businesses that are struggling today. And they are 70% of employment globally, 55% of the world's GDP, and 110% of all new job creation. You don't take care of the small and mid-sized business, you don't have an economy. Yeah, no, and I think uh, something we've realized during the pandemic is just how important small businesses are to us. Uh, I want to have one more question. It's something you just touched on, is that you are one of the few that have been successful in this space. What do you think has made it so you've been successful while a lot of others have tried this and, you know, they haven't come as far? I, would, I, I think there's, frankly, I think there are just very few of us who are doing this. Uh, second, I think a lot of those who are going direct to small and mid-sized biz find out that small and mid-sized biz, are, they're terribly busy. <laughs> they're, they're, they're running faster than you and I are. They don't have time really to take their head up out of their operation and realize, oh, I've got this great opportunity here, or I've got this great inbound email from so-and-so there. It really falls on a lot of deaf ears. The secret for us has been that instead of going directly after the edge nodes, those small and mid-sized businesses, we went to their customers. We went to those center nodes. And so that when we were able to bring in a very large enterprise, they then gave to us all of their suppliers. They gave to us all of their customers. So our, our acquisition cost has been a fraction of what others have. But, but more importantly, I think it's just, I think for a long time, finance didn't understand tech and tech did not understand finance. I think that's being changed now by the proliferation of FinTech coming together. But you know, I've been at this for 12 years. Uh, and eight years ago, we didn't have a fintech boom. And people asked mm -hmm. me, what the hell was I doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm probably one of the odd ducks out there that understands finance and has a modicum of understanding of tech. So this is kind of in my wheelhouse. But there were a lot of people in this world of finance that didn't have any idea about tech. And a lot of tech people that were too, I just said too focused, were more focused on things outside of finance because the opportunities were greater in building a B2C marketplace or, or, or doing what was done in Internet 1.0 or 2.0. Now, I think it's different. I think we'll see more success in this space as time passes. Sandy, on that note, we will leave it there. I'm excited to see what else you guys do to help small businesses in the future and just how this space evolves. Um, if you guys want to keep following along, definitely check out C2FO. And if you want to stay up to date on what's happening in fintech in general now is... Sandy said it's a, it's a big deal and more people are paying attention to this now. Check out fintechtoday.co, sign up for our newsletter, and we will keep you updated on, on all these fun things. Otherwise, thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. Thank you.